And we are live. Welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. Here we are today. We're talking about Calvinism. Should you pick a, if you can't afford seminary, should you pick a fight with a Calvinist in order to get free lectures? That's what we're going to talk about today. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Now, I want to say that everything that we do here, if you enjoy what you see here, everything that we do is comes to you by uh, donations from folks like you. So if you want to support the channel, we're at Kevin at BeyondTheFundamentals.com, Venmo, Kevin, hyphen four, Kevin Thompson, 418, with hyphens all in between. I'm a poet and don't know. We're also on Facebook, and we are on YouTube, and we invite you to subscribe to the YouTube channel, which means you have to have a YouTube channel account okay and we have um we have brother melm say no to brother melm's t-shirts i am wearing mine right now and this is amazing and uh say no to brother melm's and you can get your very own say no to brother melm's t-shirt looks like so okay and this was uh this is actually sketched by my daughter okay 18 year old going to uh the Savannah College of Art and Design here. So if um, this is a great conversation starter. This shirt has nothing overtly religious on it, which is on purpose because people are going to see that. And they're going to be like, what on earth are you talking about? Who's Brother Melms? And why do we have to say no to Brother Melms? And now you're in a conversation. So it's a conversation starter. It's designed to get you uh, talking. And then, of course, it's also, it also raises funds for the channel. If you... Um, if you don't have a Brother Melm shirt, I don't know what else we can do to keep you out of purgatory. I don't, I don't know what other recourses there are. So um, it's very important that you don one of these and get you some conversations started before it's eternally too late. You just never know. Uh, boy, I hope people get our... <laughs> sense of humor around here because not a lot of people do i was at a church one time and i talked about uh i was at a southern baptist church and i was talking about peter in acts chapter 10 and i mentioned you know peter being the first pope and all and of course i was joking well the people it was a new audience because i was supplying for somebody else at a new church and they did not know i was joking so that was kind of funny I mean, it's funny. It's funny to me when people don't know that I'm joking. So that's kind of funny. So there is this meme floating around, and I see y'all in the chat down there, people saying hello, and Brian says, we finna throw down, and Mark Rillen is uh, ready to learn some propositional truth from Brother Melms. Here we go. Now this is, we're talking about Calvinism here on our channel for most of this year so far. Most of our stuff has been very growth oriented like growth growth trajectory oriented we're looking at fowler stages of faith or if you want to consider spiral dynamics or uh what's it called integral theory we're looking at what it takes to get into what's called first tier uh second tier consciousness or second half of life wisdom or beyond stage three if you're looking at fowler and kohlberg we're looking at how do you get into stage four five and six and mainly four and five not a lot of people make it to six, but how do we get to, how do we move beyond stage three? So we've been dealing with that. Now this kind of stuff, this is very stage three stuff. Calvinism, provisionism, Arminianism, that kind of stuff is very stage three stuff. This is not where my mind is now, but I understand that a lot of people are still going through this. And as you're dealing with Calvinism, oh, um, whether you're out of Calvinism or in Calvinism, you still need to make some lateral moves before you're ready to make some vertical moves, okay? And in order for a Calvinist to grow and develop, they would need to make a lateral move out of Calvinism before they can make a vertical move on to further spiritual growth. So this is a very, uh, still a very worthwhile endeavor to come into the issue of Calvinism and talk about this topic, which is what we're going to do here today. There is a meme that floats around in various forms, and it looks something like this. If you cannot afford seminary, just pick a fight with a Calvinist and get free lectures. This one says pick a problem, and I don't know if English was that guy's first language, but it's the same idea. You see this in various different forms all over the place. Now, this guy over here, 
He said, if you can't afford seminary, pick a fight with a determinist and get free lectures. Now, why does he say determinist? Some people are constantly trying to get away from the word Calvinism. Because when you say the word Calvinism, the average Joe is going to be like, who's this? Who's Calvin? I thought we were supposed to be following Jesus Christ, not John Calvin. And the Calvinist doesn't want you to clue into the fact, you know, become aware of the fact that they are following the wrong JC. So they try to find everything else other than the term Calvinism to call themselves determinist, reformed theology, doctrines of grace, sovereign grace theology. And I heard another one the other day that I could add to this list and I already forgot. So they're trying everything they can other than use the word Calvinist, but they're Calvinists. Okay, they're following John Calvin. They're following the wrong JC. Um, and this is what they do. So it so turns out, though, um, when they put out this idea, they are thinking that you are going to learn from the things they say, like you're like you are going to learn because you're going to believe the propositional truth claims that they make. And you will learn, but not because you agree with them, but because you can see what kind of error and self-deception they are into. And when somebody becomes formulaic, they become a puppet of a system and they become somebody's script runner. You know, they're just doing formula against formula, and they're an avatar of an ideology. It's like Pinocchio before he turns into a real boy. It's what a Calvinist is. By the way, same thing the provisionist is if they're following the provisionist script. It's not, it's not this isn't just pertaining to Calvinism. It is, huh, it has to do with uh, any kind of ideology. Any kind of ideology, all right? You're not a real boy. If you're stuck inside the ideology and we want you to come out. So they think when they, when they post a meme like this, they think you're going to get into an argument with them and they're going to make propositional truth claims. You're going to be convinced by them. And that's the equivalent of your seminary education. Uh, but in reality, it's actually the opposite of that, which is what happens, which uh, like Kent Hovind used to say, even the worst of you can serve as a bad example, okay? <laughs> and so one of the, the, the primary way you learn from a Calvinist is by all the mistakes, by all the false premises. Um, Proverbs 26, 4 through 5, answer a fool according to his folly. Don't answer a fool according to his folly. It seems contradictory, but there's a reason for it. If you answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit, okay? Answer not a fool according to his folly. It's what you do with the premise, okay? If you accept the premise and you argue on the premise, naively, they just sucked you into their straw man argument. Like they will put forth, um, you don't think it's fair that God only chose some. And then when you make an argument about fairness, they just got you. It's not about fairness, see? They'll put forth something about free will. And then when you start arguing on free will, they got you. You see, free will isn't the argument. Fairness isn't the argument. There's one and only one argument. This, this issue is not complicated at all. It is very simple, very simplistic si uh, situation here. And the only issue is this. Is scripture true? That is the only issue. Never argue for free will. Never argue for fairness. Never argue for the character of God. Never argue for any of that stuff. It's one issue and one issue only. You have to get this. Now, they say this debate's been going on for hundreds of years. Actually, no, it hasn't because a lot of people are coming out of it. It hasn't been going on for hundreds of years for them. But what, the way to put the death knell to this thing is stick with our one talking point. Calvinism contradicts scripture. That's it. That's our only talking point. And every, Cal every argument a Calvinist makes in favor of what they believe is an argument against scriptural authority. Every single one of them. And all you have to do is spot it. Okay, So every time they make an argument in favor of one of their distinctives, it is a backwards reverse engineered argument against scriptural authority but it is cloaked very well. 
There's lots of equivocation. There's lots of word games. There's lots of moralism. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of little tricks and tactics and techniques. And I have a whole video called Calvinist Tactics, okay? So we are not dealing with whether something's fair or whether that is free. We don't care about any of that. We, we act as if we don't care. Our only concern is whether or not Scripture is true, okay? And if we deal with that issue. So what can we learn from Calvinists? And what, so what I'm going to do in this video, I'm going to blend some things that I've covered in the past. I did a video, 35 Truths um, That uh, Destroy Calvinism. But, and I'm going to use some of that information here to put it, to frame it in this light. Things that Calvinists teach you by accident. They actually teach you by accident. So this guy over here on the right, I actually responded to this meme. I think it was either yesterday or the day before. Not, not too long ago, I responded to him. And I said this, and so here's, here's some examples of some things that I have learned from Calvinists, okay? And it's not things that they intended to teach me, but it's things that I learned by interacting with them. And, and we'll cover that in a second. And by the way, I have it in bigger font too, so you should be able to see it, okay? But, but the, what was I about to say? Um, the things that they didn't intend to teach. Well, I guess I'll just get into that because I was going to say something which was perfect, but, you know. Mm. Some things slip the mind, especially when you're going live. Um, It's, you know, this is one of the reasons why we started getting into cognitive science, because after I came out of Calvinism, I was, I remember sitting in a pew thinking, how on earth could I be so stupid? How on earth could I, could I be so stupid to have fallen for this? I mean, this was after I came out because I was, I was duped into Calvinism. By, by a combination of things, some Calvinist professors at the University of Mobile, plus a Calvinist pastor that I had while I was serving as a youth pastor, while I was a student at the University of Mobile, a few things like that. And it was, it was kind of sold to me as a, a deeper, meatier understanding of the Christianity that I already believed. They were not honest about it. Like Mormons are honest. They will tell you that what we believe is different than what you believe, and you should come to this other church where we teach the truth and you're teaching a lie. No, Calvin is so much more sly than that. They try to slip in there with this different thing and they try to pass it off as a deeper version of what you believe. Anyway, they wind up teaching things inadvertently. And so in my quest, it's not just like, I don't just want formulaic answers. Like, here's their answer for this verse. What's the, what's the opposing answer for this verse? It's not like that. I'm like, Obviously, I mean, a Calvinist doesn't even know what hermeneutic they use until you ask them and then they Google it. What, are, what, what method of interpretation does a Calvinist use? And then they'll come back and tell you redemptive historic method. They can't even tell you what the process is for that. And not only that, but they don't realize that to have a redemptive historic method presumes something about redemption in history before using the method, which means that it's biased which means it's not an interpretive method. It's an eisegesis method. Just in the name of it. You can tell that in the name of it. But, you know, people, when they get duped into Calvinism, they have very little training in epistemics. They have very little training in hermeneutics. And they don't know the difference. And these little slights of hand get pulled on them. And bam, there they go into Calvinism. So things that Calvinists teach that they do not intend to teach. And by the way, before we get into this, you have to understand, we have a disclaimer here. Okay, because whenever we do stuff on Calvinism, we have a lot of new Calvinists who don't understand where we are coming from here. So I have to say that Beyond the Fundamentals does not promote or agree with Arminianism, Provisionism, Pelagianism, Universalism, Synergism, Monergism, or any other ideological label to which Calvinists attempt to map their theological opponents. We also do not hold free will as an axiomatic premise, nor do we worship ourselves or think that we save ourselves. We completely support biblical predestination and biblical election while rejecting Augustinian and Gnostic perversions of these concepts. So if you're a Calvinist, before you say anything, understand that first. Okay. So now let's get into things that Calvinists inadvertently teach us without realizing what they are teaching us. And here's what I have learned from interacting with Calvinists over the years. I have learned 
Here's, here's my response. My response to this guy on the right starts here, and I got two slides of this with the bigger font so you can see. Here's the whole response here, but I got two slides here. Uh, and discussions with Calvinists have been a great fielding area to probe and test to see where false premises lead to deception and ideological possession. So what have I learned? I've learned that Calvinists presume that adoption happens at conversion. It does not. Romans 8.23, it's the redemption of the body. They argue for limited atonement as if the atonement saves, which is a practical denial of the necessity of the resurrection. That's what I learned. Another way you could say this is that when you optimize for total depravity and limited atonement, you wind up having collateral damage by negating some of the other things that are also important in Scripture without realizing it's called, in the business world, this is called premature optimization, okay? Uh, what's something else I've learned? I've learned that Calvinists elevate the opinions of theologians above that of Scripture. I've learned that optimizing an entire theological system around a certain view of the human will, total depravity, is a huge mistake which orients people away from Scripture. Now, if you learn from this mistake, right, if you learn from this mistake, you should also know that we should not build an entire theological system around the other view of the human will, libertarian free will, or any of that kind of nonsense. We don't build a theological system around a premise of the human will. Okay? First of all, you shouldn't build a theological system at all because that's not what the Bible is about. Jesus is, a, is the way, the truth, and the life. He's, it's referred to as the way, this way, all through the book of Acts. And we've, cut, we've showed those slides multiple times on this channel. So the way, um, we don't want to build a theological system on free will. What we want to do is elevate scriptural authority. And we want to optimize our you know, observation, interpretation, application. We want to optimize our application based on scriptural authority, not based on a presumption of the human will, whether for or against. So you could say that... Uh, Pelagian, though Pelagius, though misunderstood and misrepresented in history, optimizing for free will and Augustine optimizing for total depravity, both of them are wrong because neither one of them are optimizing for scriptural authority. And I see non-Calvinists all the time right now doing this wrong. They're optimizing for free will. No, we optimize for scriptural authority and scriptural authority only. Okay? It's very important. It's very important to get that in to your stage three cocoon, that rigidity and structure of scriptural authority, and so that your, so that your cocoon, if you've been following some of our growth videos, you know what I'm talking about. I've leaned, learned, typo. I've learned that people fall for ideologies due to in-group related reasons rather than epistemic reasons. You see, you fall for this stuff because. Brother Melms believes it, because your professor believes it, because your pastor, because your friends, you're, you're in an in-group, and you have, like, think about my situation when I was coming out of Bible college, University of Mobile, it's a Southern Baptist Bible college in the University of Mobile, getting my theology degree, and all these professors are setting me up with recommendations to go pastor a church after I graduate from there, which I did. I went and pastored uh, Providence Baptist Church in Mobile, Alabama, until I was called to go to active duty and had to leave. And I had to go, <laughs> had to leave and go to Fort Hood and go to Iraq and go, go do some uh, outdoor activities for a while. That was fun. But that's the kind of thing. So when you have this structure of it, the networking, the recommendations, the external validation, all that stuff means something to you. And your attachment to the ideology has much more to do with that than a real genuine epistemic persuasion that the stuff is substantively sound. Okay? It's, it's very different reasons on which you're actually operating versus what you think you're operating on. You think you're convinced epistemically of its substantive arguments. You're not. You're creating post hoc rationalizations for the positions or you are being you are 
using other people's post hoc centuries. There's centuries of post hoc rationalizations for Calvinism. And you don't even have to make your own. You can use, use other people's. You can use John Owen's. You can use R.C. Sproul's or John MacArthur's or John Piper's. You can use anybody's post hoc rationalizations for why they think Calvinism is true without even having to generate your own. And so you, you can become a really good computer at spitting out somebody else's formula, even in a rivalrous scenario, and seem like you are witty and responsive and with good comebacks and good gotcha moments and all this, but really you're just running, you have a pretty good processor, but you filled it with somebody else's program and you're just running the script very well, okay? Or it seems like you are. And that's what we call simulated thinking. It's not real thinking, it's simulated thinking. You want to see examples of this, uh, listen to anything or read anything that people like uh, J.D. Martin puts out. If you follow some Calvinists on Facebook or James White or Jeff Durbin, simulated thinking, okay? It's all they're capable of. The ideology is over here and their mind is optimized to turn the Bible into something that supports the ideology. And that is the only way they will ever interpret any passage of scripture. And they will never question that, okay? Simulated thinking. They're somebody else's computer. They're not a real boy. They're Pinocchio that has not turned into a real boy. No real thinking going on there. I've learned that Calvinism exploits those with little to no theological training. When I was, I've explained this in the last video we did on predestination in Schofield, how they sit you in the classroom and they have the debates on predestination before they teach you anything about hermeneutics. Okay? So they get your mind made up, they get some thought inertia going, some idea inertia going in your head, which can't be undone with the text. What happens instead, when you see the word predestinated in passages like Ephesians 1 and Romans 8, you take what you learned from the debate and put it onto the text. You eisegete it onto the text without realizing you're doing it. Okay, I'm not saying this moralistically like, they're evil in doing it. They just don't know that they're doing that. And that's what they're doing. So it's very important to understand cognition, the science of cognition, and the psychology of cognition, and the embodiment of cognition, and the, the fact that cognition, affective valence affects cognition. There's so many things. Look at 4E cognition. All these things affect how you do how you perform as a data processor. And I said this the other day, as a matter of fact, later on in this thread with this Calvinist, I said humans as data processors, da, da, da. and somebody try, of course, they try, to, they try to find everything they can to jump on to demonize you. And they treated me like I was reducing a human to a data processor is all they are. And that's not my point. My point is that we do have to process data. And as data processors, there are a lot of things affecting the conclusions we attach ourselves to other than sound epistemic process. Your emotions, the way you were raised, any trauma you've endured, whatever in-group you're in, what your family's going through right now, how much sleep you've had, whether or not you've eaten any sugar, last time you had a cigarette, right? All this kind of stuff affects your ability to process data, okay? And, and you don't realize how much it affects your ability to process data while it's happening. Sometimes when you do things later, okay? Like if you go take an ACT test. Kevin, are you on Twitter? No, not really. I don't post anything for this channel on Twitter. <laughs> if you go take an ACT test after staying up all night, uh, and then later go take it again after getting a good amount of sleep and while you're on a good diet with good nutrition, that sort of thing, and then see what the difference is with, without it being just quantity of study. You'll notice there's a, there's a huge difference, okay? Greetings from the Isle of Manchester, UK. I am surrounded by Calvinists and recently heard a pastor say that Jesus Christ was a Calvinist. This channel is really helping me to make sense of a lot of data. Yeah, they'll say, um, Matt Slick, there's a, a, a clip from him you know, how far back does Calvinism go? And he'll go, the Apostle Paul! You know, he's a very vindictive kind of person, you know. And of course, you know, it's like um, with an ideology, and one of the reasons Jordan Peterson didn't want to come out and claim to be any kind of particular religious persuasion 
is because religious groups want to claim him as a validation for their ideology. And so a Calvinist, everyone's going to try to be claiming the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ as part of their team and validating their ideology. What they're telling you when they do that is that they're still in the carnal mind of 1 Corinthians 1 through 3. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, and the opposite side of that coin is like, here's our end group, and Apollos is, Apollos is with us, and Jesus is with us, and Peter is with us, and Paul is with us. You see, it's the same kind of thing. They're, fact, they're factious, they're, and they're a heretic in the sense, when you think heretic, you're probably thinking of believing horrible propositions. But when the Bible uses the word heretic, it's talking about a divisive and factious person, okay? And when somebody has an ideology and they're trying to say that Jesus was an ideologue like they are, that's, first, not only is that like borderline blasphemous, <laughs> but it's just trying to co-opt somebody that everyone already respects to try to validate their in-group's normative, citric normative set of propositions, which is stupidity. Okay, Jesus was metaparadigmatic. He didn't. He wasn't on a team. Okay, he wasn't part of anybody's ideology. He wasn't on a team. So when somebody comes to you know Jesus was on, they're basically saying Jesus was on our team. Jesus was not on any team. Okay, Jesus was on his own team. He was the way, and we can either get on his team, which is a metaparadigmatic team. You can't be paradigmatic and be following Jesus. The term repent comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means metacognition, which is metaparadigmatic, which means you cannot be in a paradigm and be following Jesus. So you can't be a provisionist and follow Jesus. You can't be a Calvinist and follow Jesus. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is you can't be in a paradigm and follow Jesus. That's what I'm saying. Okay? Hear, hear exactly what I'm saying. All the disclaimers that we have to do on here is because people hear things that we don't say. Yeah, who in history had the same position that you do? Okay. Your Aunt Sally's house cat. That's who. <laughs> that's, I think that John Turner is asking that as an example of what the Calvinists are constantly trying to do. And what, you're, what, you're, what you learn, if you watch Mammon Church, what you'll find out is that having... Thinking that Christianity is about holding positions is disorientation. Um, Christianity is not about holding positions, it's about transforming into the image of Christ. And you could say, who in human history held the position that having positions is the right thing to do? <laughs> okay. And that's, that's where the church, that's where you could easily see where the church went wrong. I've also learned that, because we're looking at things that we've learned from Calvinists that they didn't try to teach, Okay. Yeah, Brother Melms had the same position I did. So, uh, <laughs> I've learned that Calvinists have to Google the name of their hermeneutical method because they don't have one until pressed. They're all, you know, they all, they're, they'll be sitting there accusing you of eisegesis. And what is, I, what is exegesis? What is eisegesis? Exegesis is opening up the text and drawing out the meaning from the text, Okay. You study the text, you look at the language, the original language, you study the grammar, you study the context, the intent of the author, the reception of the audience. You try to get all of this out of the text, okay? Eisegesis is when you take a, uh, well, you know, like ex nihilo means out of nothing. So, eisegesis is when you take ideas like this and you lay them onto the text. So you learn the doctrine of predestination, then every time you see the word predestination, you impose what you learned onto that word. That's eisegesis, okay? This book, as a matter of fact, is full of eisegesis. And you learn the formula, you learn the script, and it has certain buzzwords on it. Then when you come to certain buzzwords, bam, you lay the entire erector set of ideas associated with those buzzwords onto the text that, con that contains the buzzword. That is the opposite of biblical interpretation. That's what every Calvinist is doing. They don't know they're doing it. They don't even know what his, they don't know what interpretive method they're supposed to be using. So if you ask a Calvinist face to face, what interpretive methodology do you use? They'll sit there and stare at you like a, you know, like a deer in the headlights. Unless they're like 
more advanced and have been around the block a couple of times. They have no idea. They have all these ideas about Scripture, and they're so right, but they can't even tell you what methodology derived them or what's the name of that methodology. So they're going to go Google it, and they're going to come back with something like the historic redemptive method of interpretation. And we already talked about that. It's already got premises built into the name of it. So the methodology that we endorse here is the inductive method. It has three main steps to it, observation, interpretation, and application. Now the problem with this method is that it is still based on trying to arrive at propositional conclusions. And we know from being on this channel that propositions are only one kind of knowledge and there are three more kinds of knowledge, procedural knowledge, perspectival knowledge, and participatory knowledge, none of which are addressed with propositional conclusions, which is only one kind of knowledge. Okay, So it is already limited in scope uh, if you are optimizing to use the inductive method toward propositional conclusions. But the, the third step, observation, interpretation, application, Okay. Application is really where it's at. That's what do I do as a result of this? And if you focus on that, that is where you can actually be provoked into transforming into the image of Christ. If you have a, an application focused hermeneutic is what you want. Somebody said, I tried the Jeremiah 19, five passage on a Calvinist. Um, uh, about it not entering his mind to a Calvinist friend, and he said that I don't think that's what God meant. I was quick enough to say, how should, <laughs> should, how should have God said it, you know? I, I did this with a Calvinist the other day. J.D. Martin was saying some nonsense about um, John 1, 9 says, and this is the light which light, this is the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And my position was that the text means what it says. And their position was, and there were several of them arguing against me, their position was um, that this is the light which lights every man that has light that comes into the world. They add a phrase to it to qualify. They have to add a qualifier. You see, Calvinism always has to do that. They have to add a qualifier. They can't just talk about the will of God. They have to qualify it as either the preceptive will of God or the decreto will of God. They can't just talk about the will of God like 1 Thessalonians 4.3 does. It just tells you what the will of God is. They can't just talk it. They have to qualify it. What does that mean? When they have to qualify something, when they have to qualify the word grace with words like sovereign or irresistible or doctrines of, what they're telling you is they don't believe in the grace that's in Scripture. That's what they're telling you. And when they have to qualify the will of God or they have to qualify calling with inward or outward or general or particular, which is never offered that way in Scripture, they're telling you they don't believe what appears in the text. They have to qualify it to match their ideology because they are ideologues. They are paradigmatic and need to repent, as does anybody who is paradigmatic, not just Calvinists, okay? Here's what I found. Oh, we don't care about you, Siri. Shut it. Okay. Um, looking at a couple of, uh, couple of other of these here. So the next thing we learned was, yeah, they, they don't know what their interpretive methodology is. And we, by the way, we have a seven part series and there's a couple added to it. We have a playlist on biblical interpretation. So go look that up. We have a seven part series and then we've added a few videos to that about biblical interpretation since then. Okay. We have a biblical interpretation 201, which I think was added. And then replacing dispensationalism is also in that playlist, I believe. I've learned that context and Calvinism never go together. Not one time, ever, never, ever. And I'll give you a couple of examples real quick. We can, we can look at some examples real quick with like the word uh, um, all. Okay. And this word, you know, this of course is the case with a lot of other things too. And you know, they're real bad with the word all. In Romans 5.18, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so that by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men to justification of life. Let me unhighlight that so you don't think I'm talking about that. 
they take this all here in the second part of the verse and they want that to be not all okay that's just every elect person and they want this all to really be everybody because everybody's totally depraved everybody's condemned you see how that works that's the same context it's the same context and when you fight for this all guess what's coming next they're formulaic they're simulated thinking you can predict what they're going to say next because they haven't had a thought in their head since they heard the name John Calvin. They've been programmed. What's the next thing on the script? Oh, you're a universalist. That's the next thing on the script. Well, we're not a universalist, and I'll show you why. If you look at the reference here, the free gift is a reference to what happens back in here in verse 16. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more than they which what? They which receive abundance of grace. They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. This gift of righteousness has to, and, and abundance of grace has to be received. And I don't know if I can get this to show on your screen, but when you, when you look up the word receive, there it is at the bottom. See that at the bottom popping up there? It is present, active, participle, plural, nominative, masculine. That's the parsing. What does that mean? It is active. It's not passive. It's not something you receive because somebody gives it to you. In other words, the receiver does the receiving. That's not good Calvinism. That's Bible, but it's not good Calvinism. But the receiver does the receiving. That's the grammar of it. And earlier in the, in the same chapter, they, we have received the atonement. The receiver is active there too. The receiver does the receiving there too. Calvinism is a rejection of scripture. It's not about free will. It's not total depravity. It's about rejection of scripture. And if you look at verse 18 here, the free gift came upon all men to justification of life. Well, does that mean that all men were justified? No, the free gift came to them but the free gift must be received. How do you know that? Verse 17 just told me. It just told me. All I have to do is read the verse. See, context and Calvinism never go together. Right in the same context, they want this all to be not all, and they want this all to be all without exception. What's another one? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, well, they don't believe Christ died for all, then we're all dead. Well, they do believe all were dead. So they have this all really meaning all, and this all not meaning all. For if Christ died for all of the elect, you see, so they make this big speech about all without exception versus all without distinction, as if that matters, because here's that's that's a legitimate thing that exists in real life. But in Calvinism, in Calvinistic Dungeons and Dragons world, they go with all without distinction whenever the ideology demands it, not when the context demands it. You see, and then they'll post something about you know the whole world will believe on him and this this kind of stuff. The whole world has gone after him. Was was the whole world following him? They post these out of context things. To, they give you an example of all without distinction to try to say that you are never allowed to have an all without exception. You see, they, they get to be the arbiters of when all can be without distinction, when all can be without exception. <laughs> it's, it's silly. It's silly. It reminds me of dealing with people who have personality disorders. By the way, speaking of personality disorders, this Thursday, coming to a YouTube screen near you, we are going to have a 30-year trained psychologist, therapist, counselor come on this channel and talk about the link between Calvinism and narcissism. So we are going to have that discussion Thursday afternoon. I don't have it scheduled exactly yet, but it'll be sometime after 5.30 Mountain Time. So that still needs to be scheduled, but that's coming soon. Don't miss that, okay? <clears throat> So context and Calvinism never go together. And there's lots of examples of this. What's the next thing I've learned? I have learned that Calvinists cannot keep reading. They simply can't keep reading. 
what do you mean they can't keep reading? Well, when you get to, uh, let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Just this one here. There we go. Try to make it easier on the eyes there for you folks who might be watching this on a phone or something. Romans 9.18, they can't keep reading to Romans 11.32. Ephesians 1.4, they can't keep reading to Ephesians 2.11. Uh, in John 6, they can't keep reading to John 12. In John 17, they, you can't keep reading to John 17. Same chapter, man. Same chapter, and they can't even keep reading it. All right? And of course, so you should never be dismayed when a Calvinist has a Calvinistic reasoning for a verse. You should never feel like you have to refute that because let me tell you how they came up with it. No matter what any verse says, all you have to ask yourself is, what would a Calvinist have to say about this in order to make it align with Calvinism? That's their hermeneutic. That's their only hermeneutic. Okay, And so they have to demonstrate that they have done something other than that. Okay, If, I, if the only reason you would think John 12, 32 doesn't mean what it says is if you are already intentionally committed to an ideology where John 32 can't mean what it says. That's the only reason you would ever need to read that again to try to make it say something else. Okay, so Romans 9, 18, Therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Well, didn't they ever keep reading to Romans 11, where it says God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon who? All. Well, they, they over here, they're like, God's so sovereign, he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. Well, sure, God is sovereign, and he said he's going to have mercy on all. Well, God's not sovereign anymore. <laughs> you see how that works? God just lost his sovereignty. God, God can speak authoritatively and sanctimoniously in Romans 9.18, but in Romans 11.32, he's kind of a little linguistic pansy who doesn't really have his act together, and you should probably take that one with a grain of salt. Let us... Let us explain that for you. Me and John Owen, we've got this. And you don't really take the text too seriously. Well, this is where we come in. John 9, 18. <laughs> By the way, we, we got all kinds of videos on Romans 9. In Romans 9, why, why is God hardening anybody if they're totally depraved? Why? Okay, what's going on in Romans 9? God is hardening the Jews. And opening salvation wide open to the Gentiles to where they don't have to become Jews. You know the context of Romans 9? goes back to Matthew 13 and uh, I forgot where the other passages are now. John 12, 40 is one of them. And in Luke, and I think it's Mark 4 and Luke 7 or 8 where, you know, I speak to them in parables that they may not be, you know, forgiven and their sins might not be washed away. Why... Why are you speaking to them in parables if they're totally depraved and the natural man doesn't receive the things of God's spirit anyway? And if the apostles were the good guys, why did they, have, why did they need to have the parables explained to them? So all that stuff, and by the way, that pops back up in Acts 28. That, that is a theme that goes all the way back to Isaiah 6, which goes all the way back to Leviticus 26. And see, what, what is Calvinism? Calvinism and this whole thing about, you know, Gentiles being able to get saved without having to keep the law of Moses, that, that drama plays out in the book of Acts all the way up to Acts 15, where the big uh, climax of that drama plays out and that big controversy there. So when a Calvinist uses Romans 9.18, what they are telling you is that I don't know anything about the book of Acts. I don't know anything about uh, Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 7 and 8, John 12, Acts 28, Isaiah 6 or Leviticus 26. I don't know anything about any of those or how the Bible all fits together intricately woven and is cross-sectioned all together meticulously by the hand of God. I don't know anything about that, but I have an ideology which out of context Romans 9.18 is very convenient for. What's happening in Romans 9.18 is the Jews are being hardened and blinded, Romans 11.25, same context, because they rejected the Messiah officially as a Sanhedrin. 
and salvation is being opened wide up to the Gentiles, and the Jews aren't too happy about it. That's the context of Romans 9. That's what's going on. It has absolutely nothing to do with why the Gentiles sitting next to you in church in March 2023 didn't get saved during the altar call at church. It has absolutely nothing to do with that whatsoever. It has nothing to do with anybody, any, any Jew or Gentile in 2023 not getting saved. It has nothing to do with that whatsoever. It has to do with the Jews getting hardened as and blinded as a whole. Now, any individual Jew could get saved. Paul was a Jew. He was saved. Barnabas was a Jew. He's a Levite. He was saved. Any individual Jew could still get saved, but as a whole, the nation was being hardened and blinded because the veil was in the reading of the Old Testament law, and it was all there. But any, So there was, there was no individual that could not get saved, but the nation was being, you know, 2 Thessalonians 2 kind of stuff. Because of this, the wrath has come on them to the other because they displeased God. And by the way, how could you displease God, uh, second, 1 Thessalonians 2.15, if everything that comes to pass is according to God's pleasure, according to the Calvinist interpretation of Isaiah 46.10? How could anything displease God? Well, if, if determinism was true, nothing would displease God. So they just can't keep reading. They simply can't keep reading from Romans 9 to Romans 11.32. Uh, they get to Ephesians 1.4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Well, they don't like this phrase, in him, and let me show you what happens with this phrase in him. Look at Ephesians 2, very next chapter, very next chapter. What do we find out in the very next chapter? Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ. Okay, Ephesians 1, 4, in Christ, over here, without Christ. There was a time when they were without Christ, while they were walking around like other Gentiles, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. Does that sound like an elect person to you? And without God in the world. Does that sound like an elect person to you, somebody without God? Is that somebody who is in Christ before the foundation of the world? But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Not only that, if you look at Romans chapter 16, verse 7, it's very clear that Paul had certain kinspeople who were in Christ before he was. Okay? Who were in Christ before me. Well, if he was in Christ before the foundation of the world... How did somebody else get in Christ before him? How does that work? And if they were in Christ before the foundation of the world, how did they fall out of Christ so that they could be without Christ and without God and then get back in? If the elect were in Christ before the foundation of the world, then when Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost, how did he lose them? How did he lose them if they were in Christ? How did they get lost? How does that work? And who's to say he can't lose them again? And if you were in Christ before the foundation of the world, but then you fell out of Christ, because in times past, at that time, you were without Christ, without God, having no hope in the world. If you fell out of Christ, who's to say you can't fall out again? You see, there's no consistency here. There's absolutely no consistency. The chosen here has absolutely nothing to do with being chosen for salvation. It has to do with service of being holy and without blame before him in love, which is a very practical thing, which gets played out in chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. It is purposed in Christ. Uh, I can do all things through him which strengtheneth me. That in Christ we do certain things. That goes to before the foundation of the world. And even the Calvinist will say, well, God is outside of time. Well, when you get in Christ... You get into this being who is from old, from everlasting, Micah 5, 2, and yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. You, you get put into that being. That's who you are in. So there's no problem from the Bible-believing perspective 
with Ephesians 1, 4 and Ephesians 2. But if you're a Calvinist, you've got all kinds of problems. They either have, you notice they will, if you ever hear a Calvinist quickly reference and paraphrase Ephesians 1, 4, and I have a video on this where I show lots of screenshots where they even put it in writing. They always quote, we were chosen before the foundation of the world. Aren't you missing a little phrase there, buddy? Aren't you missing a little phrase? For real, look at the text. Look at the text, you're missing a phrase. What's that little phrase? The most important one in him. What is that? That's a condition. It's a condition. Yeah. You believe in unconditional election? You tell me you were chosen outside of him? Now now watch him watch him flounder. Well well we're chosen to be in him. To be put in him. You just added phrases to the Bible. Well, we were chosen and it was foreknown. That, no, now he's starting to sound like an Arminian. They, they can't take the text like it is. They can't take it like it is. So, again, this comes down, doesn't come down to free will, doesn't come down to any of this stuff. It comes down to, do we believe what the text says? They cannot reconcile Ephesians 1-4 with Ephesians 2. And therefore, they have to twist it. They either have to leave out the phrase in him, take away from the Bible... Or they have to add to it, chosen to be in him, which is not what it says. So they got problems either way around. And when it comes to adding to or taking away from the Bible, you might want to look at Deuteronomy 4, 2, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5 and 6, and Revelation chapter 22, verses 19 and 20, before you go taking away and adding to the words of Scripture. You have a warning not to do that in the beginning of the Bible in Deuteronomy, right in the middle in Proverbs, and at the end in Revelation. Do not add to or take away from Scripture. But if you are a Calvinist, you have to add to or take away from Scripture. What's another example of that? If I go to Acts chapter 13, verse 48. Very famous Calvinist so-called proof text. What's the text say? It says, And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. That's what the text says. That's not what a Calvinist believes. What's the Calvinist believe? And as many as were ordained by God from before the foundation of the world to believe, to eternal life believed. That's what they believe. That's not what the text says. And they don't even realize, they don't even realizing they are adding that idea to the text, which isn't what it says. You know what the point, you know what the point here is of Acts 13.48? It's Acts 13. What is coming up in Acts 15? Luke is building up the reader to the fact that some people think you have to keep the law and be circumcised to be saved. And some people think that you can, you know, your hearts can be purified by grace through faith. Acts 15, 9 through 11. Well, they finally conclude that it's Acts 15, 9 through 11. And what are we dealing with here? We're, we're dealing with Gentiles. Luke is making the case that Gentiles can get saved and have eternal life without keeping the law, without being circumcised, but just by belief. So he emphasized believe to tell you that they didn't have to keep the law or be circumcised. And by the way, that word ordained, we think that's a very, you know, God ordained these things. God is not the subject of any verb in Acts 13, 48. And that word could just as easily be uh, rendered as disposed toward eternal life, something like that. But the point is, when it's all said and done, those who were ordained to eternal life, the point is that they believed, not that they had to become Jewish proselytes or keep the law or be circumcised. Why don't Calvinists get this? Because they don't understand the context. They, they are numb to the context. They have no idea about the context. They are optimizing for stuff that reinforces their paradigm, their ideology. They're not optimizing for what the text says, and they have no idea what the book of Acts is trying to say anyway. And it's taking 28 chapters to show you the transition from having to be a Jew or a proselyte in order to be saved, the transition to over to where the Gentiles do not have to be proselytes, don't have to keep the law, don't have to be circumcised to be saved, and that's why he's emphasizing the word believed there. That's the point. I 
Calvinists will explain away any contradiction instead of rejecting their theology. Right. The paradigm serves three purposes, and when it comes to dissonance, resolving dissonance, they never resolve dissonance to the point where it updates the paradigm. They keep the paradigm, which the technical word for that is delusion. So John 6.44, the, the Calvinist can't keep reading what just six chapters later, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. Um, John 12.32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to me. Well, what is that a reference to? It tells you in the very next verse in John 12 that that is a reference to the manner of death that he would die to be crucified. Okay? What does that mean? So before Christ is crucified, who's doing the drawing? The Father. After Christ is crucified, who's doing the drawing? The Son. Okay. There's two members of the Godhead. Where does the Holy Spirit do the drawing? doesn't not in scripture anyway there's no there's no scripture that says the holy spirit does any drawing no scripture at all the father does and the son does who's doing it before the crucifixion the father who's doing it after the son uh, what's the result of the father drawing it is that the person what can come notice that word can what the calvinist believes is this the calvinist takes out the word can and they see this as no man comes to me except the Father which sent me draw him and I will raise him at the last day. But that pesky little word can. If the Father draws a person, what's the result? The se- you know what the sentence is here? You know what the subject and verb of the sentence is here? Man can come. That is the subject and the verb. Man can come. That's, the, that's it. That's the sentence. Everything else is dressing that up. Everything else is... Uh, exception clause, adjectival modifiers, everything else is dressing that up. And the result of a man being drawn, exception clause, is that he can come. Not that he's forced to come. Well, you don't understand the, the meaning of the word helkuo. We understand it just fine. And it really doesn't matter what you put there, helkuo or draw or chopped him up like a birthday cake. It doesn't matter what you put there. The result is can come because that's what the sentence says. You see? And if you don't believe that, you don't believe the Bible. That's, that's the grammar of the sentence. That's what it says. Okay? So even back then, and by the way, Calvinists are real bad about this. Speaking about context, there's things that are very important. Like, don't you think that um, the audience being Gentiles might be important to people like us in the United States? Don't you think that's probably important? Did you know that Jesus' ministry was primarily to Israel and it was only to non-Jews by exception? Like the woman at the well, the Canaanite woman, the centurion, those were by exception. You know, uh, Acts, uh, Matthew 15, 24, I'm not sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In Matthew 10, 5 through 10, he told him, don't go to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans, just go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what he told him. That was the standing instructions in Matthew 10. Don't go to the Gentiles. And don't you think that, so for a Calvinist to cite a passage that is two Jews during a time when the ministry is not programmatically to Gentiles yet and won't be till halfway through the book of Acts, why are they citing this? Don't you think that the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ is pretty important? Why aren't you citing passages after that? Don't you think the coming of the Holy Spirit is pretty important? John 7, 39, the Holy Spirit was not yet given. So it couldn't have been the Spirit drawing there. Holy Spirit was not yet given. Some people have all these arguments. They want to go to John 16. want to go to all these things. Is the Spirit drawing? A.W. Pink can't be wrong. Well, A.W. Pink is wrong. Okay? John 7, 39, the Holy Spirit was not yet given. And then Jesus spends three chapters in John 14, 15, and 16 talking about the Comforter, which is going to be given later. (laughs) It's, uh, there's so many things that you have to not think about in order to be a Calvinist. So whenever a Calvinist cites John 6, 44, what they're telling you is that the audience isn't important. The timing isn't important. Whether or not Christ died and rose again isn't important. Whether or not the audience is Jewish or Gentile isn't important. They're, they're telling you they have no idea about those things. They're telling you they have no clue uh, that any of those things have any weight whatsoever. 
How should we view John 16, 8? We view it as saying what it says. Okay? He will convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. What's, what's the problem? John 17, 9. This one's the same chapter. They can't keep reading John 17, 9. I pray for them. Well, here he has, you know, someone, Calvinists always quote this one. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Okay. Let him have. So the try, what they're trying to do is they're trying to come up with, uh, this guy's quoting Revelation 2, 22, 17. What they're trying to do is they're trying to come up with examples of like the Holy Spirit drawing. Well, isn't that the Holy Spirit drawing? Okay. What I'm telling you is that there's not a passage that says the Holy Spirit draws while we do have one. It says the Father draws before the Holy Spirit's... I, I'm going to show you that. I have to show you that. Okay? I don't think... There's something about ink on the page that has some power to it. Look at John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father. Now, Jesus spends a lot of time talking about the Comforter and the Spirit. So here's a, here's a little, you know, preschooler question. Does Jesus know the difference between the Father and the Holy Spirit? I would say yes, looking at John 14, 15, and 16. I have many things to say unto you, however you, know, you cannot bear them yet. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. What does that mean? He wasn't there yet. John 6, 44, watch this. I'm going to scroll to John chapter 7. And then we're going to get to verses 38 and 39. And look what they say. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, okay, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Holy Ghost is not yet given. Is Jesus confused about the role of the Holy Ghost and the Father one chapter earlier in John 6, 44, and he meant to say the Spirit? Okay. Just look at it. We have videos on John 6.65 and all that stuff. Okay? Somebody saying, read John 6.45, all this kind of stuff too. We got videos on, on John 6 stuff. So go watch those as well. The next thing Calvinists can't seem to read, John 17.9, they can't seem to keep reading. And there's a lot of stuff in, like, um, I'm not going to get into John 6 because there's so much where he already gave. He gave his son for the life of the world. You know? Well, it's already been given. All you have to do is receive it. The Father has, in other words, the Father has already drawn them. There's nothing stopping them. The, the drawing doesn't prevent anybody. John 17, 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Now, the Calvinist interprets this as, I pray not for the world because I don't care about them, because I'm the Calvinist God, and I hate all the workers of iniquity, Psalm 5.5, 5, and therefore I'm not going to pray for them because I don't care about them and I don't love them. All right? And that's not what's going on here. This is one of those things, do you prepare the child for the road, or do you prepare the road for the child? Okay? Before your kid goes to college, do you prepare them for college, or do you change the college around to make it appropriate, you know, fitting for the kid to go there? No, you prepare the kid to go to college. And this is the same kind of thing here. I pray not for the world. In other words, I'm not trying to reshape the world, but for I'm praying for the people going in it that you would keep them from the evil as they go into the world. I'm not trying to shape, shape and change the world, the environment that they're going into. That's what's going on here. But a Calvinist tries to say, I pray not for the world because I don't care about them and I hate them and I want them to all be damned and go to hell, but I'm just praying for the elect. And by the way, the ones that he has, thou hast given me, he's just praying for the 12 apostles here. Are you trying to tell me the 12 apostles are the only ones that are ever going to be saved? Which, by the way, not even the 12 apostles were all saved because one of them, I have lost, verse 12, and I have lost none of them except the son of perdition. So he loses one. Okay. How's that for being elect? So there goes Judas. There's no Judas anymore. And his bishop, he is replaced with Matthias over in Acts chapter 1. So when he says, I pray not for the world, he's not, he's not excluding the world from any kind of ministry or hope. 
He's just not, he, what he's emphasizing is getting these 12 apostles, keep them from the evil as they go into the world. I'm not trying to reshape the environment of the world. And then um, John 17, 21. Neither pray I for these alone. Look, all they got to do is keep reading. It's right there in the same. It's right there in the same chapter. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that thou mayest be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So he does pray for the world. Does not pray for the mirror? Are you following me here? So the things that we learned, yeah, we learned that Calvinists cannot keep reading. Why? Once they find something that satisfies their ideology, they stop, okay? And there's some people posting things down here in John 6. There's all kinds of things in John 6 that turn Calvinism on its head. We've got other videos on that. We're not going to get into that here. What else have I learned from Calvinists? I've learned that Calvinists are optimized to justify, huh, nope, that's the, huh. They're optimized to justify their paradigm instead of discover what scripture means and how it applies. They start with their paradigm. What's the paradigm say? What does it need? Like I can't, I can't have John, 1 John 2, 2. He's a propitiation not for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I can't have that meaning what it says. And so I have to explain that in a way that allows Calvinism to persist. That's what they're optimizing for when they go to Scripture. They are never, ever concerned with what Scripture actually says, what it means, and how it applies. This was that true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. There we go. That's one that we talked about just a few minutes ago. What else have I learned? I've learned that Calvinists use moralistic reasoning in a feigned epistemic arena. Um... I'll give you an example of this. Feigned moralistic reasoning in an epistemic arena. Here's a meme from a Calvinist. I mean that when I tell people I'm an Arminian, they think I'm from the Middle East or, or the army or some or like min, or I like minions. And frankly, all of those sound better than a Christian who denies the sovereignty of God, so I let it slide. Now this is somebody trying to be funny. Um so what are they doing here? It's a false dichotomy because non-Calvinists are not Arminians. Arminians are actually a branch of Calvinism. But they, they have to have neat, compartmentalized, pre-categorized opposition. Because since they are ideologues, since they're following a formula, they can't actually think and listen to a nuanced position which isn't prefabricated for them and handed down to them with a you know, pre-decided formula for them. They can't actually listen to somebody else's beliefs. They're constantly having to pigeonhole them. And they ask a bunch of sophistry-style questions to try to pigeonhole them all the time. And down here, when he says, a Christian who denies the sovereignty of God, this, that has a moralistic overtone. Like if, like if you don't believe the way we do, then you deny the sovereignty. Like, like acknowledging the sovereignty of God somehow makes you more righteous or holy. It, or acknowledging it the way they understand it somehow makes you more righteous or holy. Notice what's not addressed here. Scriptural authority. Every single time a Calvinist deals with the issue of sovereignty or God's glory, what are they doing? They are circumventing scriptural authority. That's your clue, by the way. That's, that's, that's me stomping on the feet. <laughs> I'm stomping my foot as the professor in the classroom letting you know every time a Calvinist is talking about God's sovereignty or the glory of God, they are intentionally sidestepping the fact that they are negating scriptural authority every single time. All you have to do is be aware of that and then look for the angle and exploit it. Okay, that's all you have to do. Um, yeah, so they use moralistic reasoning all the time. And we could really get into that. 
I've learned that equivocation is a primary tool of Calvinists. Equivocation. Um, what's an example of equivocation? Here's one right here. Right here in this thread where I'm talking to this dude. Here's the end of my statement up here. And this dude says, where do you see Calvinism in the OP? Because I'm like talking to a Calvinist, talking to a Calvinist, and his OP didn't say Calvinist. He changed it to determinist. Ooh, wasn't that clever? That just means he's not a Calvinist, doesn't it? <laughs> that's, that's, that's how ridiculous they are. It's how absolutely ridiculous they are. So I said, feel free to substitute determinist anywhere you see Calvinist in my response. And this is the kind of equivocation that demonstrates how correct my answer is. They're constantly equivocating. They want to give you a term and it has to mean something else. It means something, one thing over here, and it means something else over here. And so there's no consistency to it. It's the exact same thing going on right now in politics. What, do you, what is a woman? What's the scientific definition of a woman? And somebody who's going to be a judge can't even tell you. It's the exact same kind of thing going on within Calvinism when they are equivocating on terms. That we lose the language and the language has to be inflated in order to try to say what you're trying to say. What else have I learned? I've learned that Calvinism is essentially the development of clever post hoc rationalizations for why scripture isn't true. John 1 9, for example. Just so happens that somebody put John 1 9 right here in the, in the chat. This was that true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I just read a long thing by J.D. Martin the other day on why that verse means something other than what it says. And I wound up asking the guy, one of the other dudes wanted to argue with me. I'm like, suppose that Jesus really was that true light which lights really every man that comes into the world. Suppose that was the case. How would God, how could God convey it to you in a way that you would accept? How should God have said that if that were the case? And what they've done is they put themselves in, in a position to where there are certain things God can't say to them because they can't accept it. They can't receive it. They can't take that verse. So it has to mean something else. And J.D. basically came out and said, this was that true light which lighteth every man that has light that comes into the world. The qualifier is already here. What's the qualifier? Every man that cometh into the world. Now he's adding another qualifier, another man that has light that's coming into the world, trying to limit it and make it exclusive down to the Calvinistic group. That's not what the text says. And then 1 John 2, 2, also, he is a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Well, they can't have that. They can't have that mean what it means. So anyway, it's all Calvinism is, is clever post hoc rationalizations for why scripture isn't true. That's all it is. What else have I learned? I've learned that Calvinists can't tell the difference between Augustinian predestination and scriptural predestination. We've touched on this a lot in our previous video on Schofield and predestination. So I would refer you to that and see our video, Predestination, It's Nothing Like You Were Told. That's basically our flagship video on the topic of predestination which i one of the places i tell everybody to start when you're dealing with the calvinist issue what's another thing i've learned from calvinist i've learned that calvinism thrives on false dichotomies what does that mean there's calvinism and arminianism there's monergism and synergism you see it's it's all these is augustine and pelagius there's there's no nuance there's there's no third way there's nothing out there that's different than all these prefabricated False dichotomies, inward call, outward call, uh, decretal will, pre pre <laughs> preceptive will. There, there is no other, there's the, all these false dichotomies that are out there and they pigeonhole. They thrive on false dichotomies. What's another thing I've learned? I've learned that Calvinism spreads itself by demonizing everything that isn't it. And standing by as if they are the only default alternative while not being able to present anything good or truthful about themselves. What does that mean? They did a video of the American Gospel. And it's basically Calvinists. They, they, have a, they don't promote Calvinism overtly. 
See, they're sly. They're subtle. They're deceptive. They're not telling you, we think Calvinism is wonderful. They're telling you all the bad things with Bethel and with Catholicism and with the charismatic movement and with some cults. They're telling you all the bad things and all the attacks on the gospel that are out there. But they have a bunch of fairly well-known Calvinists giving, delivering these messages and warning of these dangers. And the implication is that they're not coming out and telling you is that coming to us is the way to escape all this error and guarantee that you don't have to face any of this error or fool with it anymore. That's the implication, that they don't come out and say. They're sly and subtle. So instead of saying, hey, we're Calvinists and here's everything we believe and here are all the reasons you should agree with us, they don't do that. They put out all these warnings about all these other things that you don't want. You don't want to be a Pelagian. You don't want to be a synergist. You don't, da, 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 da. They have all these things to not be, and then they're just standing by as if that's the only default alternative in order to not be these other heretical things that you definitely want to stay away from because they're so evil. Subtle. What's another thing I've learned? I've learned that when a Calvinist tries to elevate the glory of God, they do so to cover up a denial of Scripture. Every time they elevate the glory of God, they're denying Scripture somewhere in the immediate context of the conversation, of whatever they're saying or doing. You just got to find what that is. So my conclusion was talking to a Calvinist is not a good replacement for seminary. It's actually a practicum in getting exposure to, syst uh, to system of disorders ranging psychologically, you can say systems of disorders, ranging psychologically from cognitive dissonance to narcissism to psychosis and ranging theologically from pride to idolatry. And yes, the pride, that is a little moralistic there, but that is what's going on, okay? So the psychologically, you're, in Calvinism, you're ranging from cognitive dissonance to narcissism to psychosis, and then theologically, they're ranging theologically from pride to idolatry. So those are the things that we learned from Calvinists. And then we have a video called 35 Truths That Destroy Calvinism, and I highly recommend that you go look at that because there are some more detailed things that we learn from Calvinists. And you know, when you have the Christian meme complex, right? And basically it's just all the collection of ideas of things that are considered Christianity. And the central meme of the Christian meme complex is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ on the authority of scripture. That would be the central meme of the Christian meme. That's not the same as an axiom. The axioms are that God exists, God can't lie, Scripture came from God, therefore Scripture's true. Those are the axioms. This is the central meme of the meme complex, different thing, okay? This is what we consider to be the most fundamental thing, would be the death and resurrection of Christ on the authority of Scripture. And the authority of Scripture part does tie it back to the axioms, but it's also listed in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, with the phrase, according to Scriptures, Okay? So your Christian meme complex would have a lot of ideas in it. What Calvinism does with its meme complex is it has signal hijacking. So it is like a parasite or, or like a cancer that has to have a body as a host. So when a Calvinist talks, this is one of the reasons you hear me use the word distinctive is a lot. And this is very important. That word distinctive is important because a lot of times when a Calvinist is talking, they will say these things, okay? They will say these things. Because they have to inhabit, they have to, like a parasite, they have to inhabit a host. Christianity is the host body. So a broken clock is right twice a day. They are, they are going to say things that are in the Christian meme complex because that's the host they are inhabiting as a parasite. But of the things that comprise their distinctives, they all come from Manachian Gnosis. They're all optimized. They're, they're all derivatives from optimizing for the Manachian Gnostic concept of total depravity. And when, so whenever they talk of their distinctives, they are, there is never scripture. There is never context. Context and scripture, con context and Calvinism never go together. 
context and Calvinist distinctives never go together. Scripture and Calvinist distinctives never go together. Not one single time ever, never. And you say, well, you know, I heard a Calvinist. Well, Cal yeah, I heard a Calvinist say a couple of good things. Yeah, they have to say this stuff to pass themselves off as Christians. But their distinctives, the cent you know, this meme complex down here has its own central meme which is not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The central meme for which they are optimizing for their meme complex is total depravity. It is a different central meme. It's a different meme complex that, like a parasite, is inhabiting the Christian meme complex. It's a different thing. Now, for those of you who are following the four kinds of knowing and our growth models and things like that, you understand that this is still all propositional. Still doesn't solve the problem. We're still mammon church. We're still not optimizing for growth and transformation. And I got that. And it's good that you notice that. Now, that's how it's built. How is it delivered back to you? It's delivered back to you. It's Notice the, the building block over here is total depravity. They're optimizing for that and how the, and how the ideology is framed and built. When they feed it to you, when they deliver it, it's based on the sovereignty of God. You see? Because they, their moralistic thing, we, our theology is God-centered. Actually, it's not. It's built on the total depravity of man. It's actually man-centered in its idea and the fact that they have to elevate men theologians who understood things the Bible doesn't say. So they have to elevate men above scripture in their ideology and the central meme of their meme complex is the total depravity of man. Everything about Calvinism is man-centered. It is the most man-centered theology in its formation. And then when they deliver it, they're very sly with the narrative. It's a narrative warfare. And they try to deliver it as if the sovereignty of God is the central meme of their meme complex. But notice what it's not. It's not scriptural authority. You notice that? It's not scriptural authority. It's the sovereignty of God put forth in a, in a moralistic way. You see the little game they're playing here? This has them. They, don't even, they play this game and they don't even know they're doing it. And that's what's happening epistemically, psychologically. So they will grab things from the Christian meme complex, like the attributes of God and whatnot, whatnot and they will try to leverage them for their, you know, putting forth their narrative over and above scriptural authority. That's what they're going to try to do. So in my, what I was originally going to call the 35 truths that destroy Calvinism was really a salvation theory of everything, but that doesn't get a lot of views. You see, salvation theory of everything doesn't get a lot of views. So you would have to say, 35 truths that destroy Calvinism because people will click on that because you guys are sick. That's why. That's why we have to do That's why we have to come up with the titles because you guys are just so depraved and terrible. All right. We could have better titles if it wasn't for you guys. And so what is, uh, that's that sense of humor coming back in there, seeing if anybody catches in on it. While I'm 44 and my parents went to a Word of Faith church when I was born, thank God for a good biblical doctrine such as Calvinism. <laughs> um, can in Christ, I thought he was, I thought this person was joking. All men doesn't always mean all men everywhere. If you read the whole context of some of those passages, you would understand that's not, that's not as clever as you think. You need to go back and watch the first part. Go back and start watching from the beginning of this video and also go back and watch our Look at our disclaimer for new Calvinist viewers. Okay. Um, Calvinism is to Christian as cancer is to a healthy cell. That's exactly what's going on. So for these 35 things, what are some of the things that they are? And we'll go through these real quick. Is that scripture is from God and God cannot lie. That's the biggest thing that overthrows Calvinism. Predestination is of existing saints to adoption and glorification, not of sinners to conversion. Election is to service and calling uh, and purpose, not to salvation. And yes, we have a whole video on 2 Thessalonians 2.13, which you can go look up. Adoption is the future redemption of the body. It is not conversion. Sinners become sons of God through the new birth, not through adoption. 
There are two callings, gospel call and vocational call, not inward and outward or effectual and ineffectual. Christ's life, not his death, is what saves. A sinner is saved by regeneration, not the atonement. Glorification is what's limited, not atonement. By the way, these are um, some stage three things. I might word these differently today, but this is all in the 35 Truths That Destroy Calvinism video, and that we talk about them at more length there. When Christ said it is finished on the cross, everyone was still in their sins, as per 1 Corinthians 15, 17. The finished work of Christ on the cross. Christ's work was not finished on the cross, so don't say that phrase. Atonement is one component of many components in salvation. It alone is not what saves. We are saved by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, not by the atonement. Atonement is a prerequisite for salvation. It is not the execution of it. Why? We are saved by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, not by the atonement. Calvinists talk about the atonement and then non-Calvinists follow suit as if it's the atonement that saves. There is no passage anywhere in any testament that says the atonement is what saves. Yes, it's needed for justification. Yes, it's needed for forgiveness. Yes, it's needed for a bunch of things. And it plays a role in salvation. And it is a necessary component of salvation, but not a sufficient component of salvation. The atonement must be received. Romans 5, 10 through 11. The atonement does not glorify anyone. And the point there is that we are supposed to be glorified. And atonement isn't what does that. So it's not what... There's some saving that continues to happen that the atonement doesn't do, but is needed for in advance. When Calvinists call, what Calvinists call the golden chain of redemption contains no direct reference to the atonement. And you might want to point that out to them when they say that. Belief that salvation for anyone was secured on the cross constitutes a denial of the necessity of the resurrection. Salvation is eternally secured by the sealing of the Spirit, not by election. There is no sealing of the Spirit before Pentecost or after the Harpazo of the Church. There are two aspects to salvation, presence, effects of sin, and lack of glorification. Nothing that eradicates sin glorifies the sinner. Both aspects must be resolved for salvation to occur, and a lot of people leave out the glory part, which you have to realize that the doctrinal part of Romans is climaxing in Romans 8, centered all around glory and redemption of the body and the glorification of the person. That's the point. And you were primed for this in Romans 3.23 when it said, All have sinned and what? Come short of the glory of God. So the rest of the chapter, an original reader, forget all your theology, should be waiting with bated breath to see how that glory gets dealt with, that lack of glory gets dealt with. And we don't learn that fully until chapter 8. That's the climax that Romans 3.23 was leading the reader to. And people don't get that. It's not about getting sin eradicated. That was taken care of at the cross. Colossians 2.14. The handwriting of ordinances that was against us was taken out of the way. Is there some other handwriting of ordinances that wasn't taken out of the way for the non-elect? The sin is dealt with. Sin is not the problem. Lack of glorification is the problem. Conviction of the Holy Spirit is necessary for salvation, but occurs to sinners alike, regardless of the consequent faith or unbelief. It is not irresistible or unconditionally selective. Grace is ubiquitous reality, not a selective force. Grace is just fine on its own, as it's found in Scripture. Any modifier other than free, such as sovereign, resistible, irresistible, or provenient, indicates someone is either confused or attempting to confuse. And that free comes from passages like Romans 3, 24, 5, 15, John 1, 16, and Titus 2, 11 through 13. Died to save is not a biblical phrase or concept. It is therefore senseless to pit it against died to make men savable since the premise is false to start with. Because Calvinists will always say, did Jesus die to save or did he die to make men savable? Well, there's no passage that says Christ died to save anyone. That's not what saves. The washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost is what saves. Who does God do that to? 1 Corinthians 1.22, 1.21. It's funny, I always mistype that too. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God washes regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, those that believe. That's what happens. 
So I would ask a Calvinist, where, hold on, where does the Bible say Christ died to save anyone? Let's clear that up. And what are you doing? You're going back to scriptural authority when you do that. Number 24, sinners are born of God by the will of God after they receive Christ. Number 25, monergism and synergism is a false dichotomy invented in the 1890s. Calvinists are synergists based on their own definition of these terms. We have a whole video on that, which I recommend that you go watch if you want to dig into that. Number 26, God is pleased to save those that believe, that believe, not cause belief in those that he saves. Number 27, the free gift unto justification of life is to all men it must be received. It is not universalism unless irresistible grace supplants the biblical requirement to receive. Once again, it goes back to what the text says, as we covered earlier. 28. Foreknow is being known by God in the sense of Galatians 4.9 after conversion and before glorification, as if already glorified. It does not refer to any time prior to conversion. You're going to want to go watch the video on the 35 truths that destroy Calvinism to hear more about that. 29. Nobody was in Christ before the foundation of the world. Nobody was in Christ before they were placed in Christ during their lifetime. 30. Free will or lack thereof or lack of a type of it, such as libertarian, is not a proper interpretive preconsideration. Scriptural authority is the one and only concern irrespective of the implications to man's will. Can't get that nailed in hard enough. People don't get that. Unbelief, number 31, unbelief condemns a person not because it is an unforgiven sin, but because it is an exclusive point of access to the grace. Romans 5, 2, by whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That's a very important part. It's not because unbelief is an unforgiven sin that Christ didn't die for. None of that nonsense. It's because it's the point of access to grace. It's that simple. 32. Arminianism is a branch of Calvinistic thinking, and it's wrong for all the same reasons that Calvinism is wrong. 33. Israel is who's being hardened in Romans 9. The recipients of mercy are identified in Romans 11.32. 34. The Holy Spirit is the only member of the Trinity, or Godhead, if you don't like the word Trinity, who doesn't draw in the New Testament. Okay? 35. God's sovereignty and salvation means that he executes it in accordance with Scripture, and not in accordance with Hindu fatalism. Um, all right. So once again, for the, we got some new people here. So remember, our, our new our new Calvinist viewer disclaimer: Beyond the Fundamentals does not promote or agree with Arminianism, Provisionism, Pelagianism, Universalism, Synergism, Monergism, or any other ideological label to which Calvinists attempt to map their theological opponents. We also do not hold the free will as an axiomatic premise, nor do we worship ourselves or think that we save ourselves. We completely support biblical predestination and biblical election while rejecting Augustinian and Gnostic perversions of these concepts. Let's see what we have here in the chat section. Let's see who we have in the kitty corner. What do we have? So much of what you teach helps me deal with people in the cult. Thanks, BTF. You're welcome. Thanks for the feedback. Um... Must be nice to know whatever you do was God and not you. Scary stuff. I mean, a really bad cult all day. Is he having fun calling me sick because of his clickbait? Nope, I don't have fun calling anybody sick. It's a sad thing when people are sick. As a Calvinist, we need to maintain the universal love uh, of God and the genuine offer of the gospel. If either of these malign, we cannot follow Ephesians 5.1, the call to imitate God. Um... You can't follow God as a Calvinist. Okay? You can't, you can't follow or imitate God as a Calvinist. So as a Christian, you need to maintain scriptural authority and get away from Calvinism. What needs to happen? Um, especially SDAs who are full of inconsistencies. Sounds like he's picking on Jamie, who I think is an SDA. I don't think they're listening to what you're saying, judging by the, the answer. The developing Christian mind must go through a Calvinist stage in order to prepare it for the higher stage of faith that can perceive the love of God's universal, unconditional forgiveness of all. This is one of the things we were talking about earlier is that, you know, we've kind of moved away from dealing with Calvinism. Um, kind of like uh, it's just it's just time to move away from some toys. You know, you just outgrow them. And, but there are still people in, you know, in that stage, in that phase who need to make some lateral moves as they continue to grow. And I do think that um, 
Calvinism, if you watch our videos on growth and cocoons and stuff like that, it is a phase that a lot of people go through, but it's like something that gives you uh, a, con a cocoon with not very good integrity so that you don't develop well in it. So I, I, would, I advise people to make a lateral move out of Calvinism and into something that's epistemically sound and stable so that you have um, good epistemic rigidity in which you can continue to form and grow, okay? Something that's not doesn't require cognitive dissonance. Calvinism is like the potty seat for Christians developing sexually <laughs> Calvinism. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> he must think Calvinism is limited to the five points. This guy does not understand Calvinism, but yes, I was tempted to watch because of clickbait. Be blessed, chat, and learn for yourselves. So, um... The um, that's the gaslight. The number one gaslighting that Calvinists do is to say you don't understand Calvinism. I used to be a Calvinist. I was trained in Calvinism by Calvinistic professors. Okay, uh, I've got over three hundred videos on Calvinism, and I have a video out there that says what is Calvinism, and I haven't had a Calvinist yet to tell me one factual error that's in that video, and it's just a thirteen-minute video. Okay. So we understand Calvinism just fine. We're just not presenting it palatably, which is what you would prefer. So what when someone, this person can in Christ, what they're really saying is that um, I don't like the way you present Calvinism and I want to be in charge of the narrative with which it's presented so it can be presented palatably. All right, that's what they're saying. But it comes out as you don't understand Calvinism. We understand it just fine. <clears throat> agreed on the atonement it's not sal salvific if all of us understood hebrews 9 and exegeted it we could come to some sanity on that the preacher of the last church i went to went to cemetery he said everyone had to be at least a two-point calvinist yeah a lot of people i wish kevin could write the definitive book on this stuff i'd snap it up all right i'll take that as a uh i'll take that as a challenge and i'll uh, write a definitive book on calvinism um but I'm going to need some early adopters on this bad boy because I can't afford the time to do it right now. I've got to work too much. I spend all day, every day, remediating cybersecurity vulnerabilities for a Fortune 4 company when I wish I could be writing a book on this stuff. But we've got to keep y'all's got to keep y'all's health information safe from bad actors. <sighs> Faith is a gift of God as is every breath you take, and that gift was already given to everybody. Okay? Philippians 129 can be preached to any lost person. The day after Passover is always Sabbath. Hi, Sabbath. Just got here, but fighting a Calvinist sounds a lot funnier. I'm a hyper-Calvinist. <laughs> All right, this has been fun. So... I want to remind everybody a couple things real quick. Remember, we have the t-shirts. Remember, we uh, if you want the t-shirt, the link to get your t-shirt is in the description below this video. Highly encourage you to get that and rework off fundraising here. So if you can help support the funds, if you want to see more videos like this, send us a message, send us some support financially, send us some prayers, and... Uh, yeah, if you want, if you have something you want me to cover on the channel, shoot me an email. Hey, I'd like to see a video on this topic. Um, and I'm not, I'm probably not going to do like an expose of completely. I'm not going to do like the Hebrew Roots Movement or Jehovah's Witnesses. There's plenty of other people doing fine with that stuff, All right, But when it comes to Calvinism or when it comes to uh, what we've been dealing with growth lately, Christian growth, that kind of stuff, you want to see something specifically along those lines shoot me a message. All right, guys. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. I appreciate that. She says, uh, thanks for all you do. And uh, thanks, everybody in the chat. Thanks, everybody who watched. May the Lord bless you. And good day. <laughs>